Thank you, Jackie. Well, uh, good morning again. We have been uh, spending the summer making our way through this little chunk in the book of Psalms called the Psalms of Ascent. These are Psalms 120 through 134. It's this little uh, particular section of the book of the Psalms where the people of Israel would sing them as they made their way up to the elevated city of Jerusalem. They ascended to Jerusalem. They would sing these songs on their way. These were songs for their sojourn as a way to fortify themselves and give them courage, articulating their faith as this journey. We're on this journey towards God. And so for those of us who uh, claim to follow Christ, these songs are for us as well. We too understand faith to be this journey where we are pursuing God and on, a, on this journey towards the, the city of God. And we need these songs just as much as they did. We need these songs to give us strength and courage and to fortify us. And uh, the, Psalm 128 that we just heard read is a psalm about happiness. Uh, you see that word blessed in the first verse, and that word blessed shows up four times in these six little verses, which you can also translate as the word happy. It's kind of fundamentally what it's at its root. And uh, Freud once asked this question, what is it that human beings most want? If you analyze their behavior and said, okay, if you just see what human beings are chasing and pursuing, what is it that they're after? And here's his answer to that question. He says, quote, the answer to this can hardly be in doubt. They strive for happiness. They want to become happy and to remain so which is obvious. I mean, we all kind of want to be happy. Even the, uh, those of us who are, have a temperament that may be wired to be a little bit more dour, we, we, you know, we still want to be happy. Uh, what isn't obvious, though, is how you get it. I'll, I'll tell you, the, the answer that most people provide to that question of how do you get happiness, the answer that most people provide can really be boiled down to one word. And it's the word more. I will be happy if I get more, more money, more square footage, more vacation, more likes and retweets, more food, more sex, more sleep, more whatever. You know, it's interesting, every single um, year, uh, they, they the, the powers that be, put out this world uh, happiness report. They, they rank countries based off of the, the happiness level of the citizens. And um, countries like the U.S., U.K., Singapore, which are extremely wealthy uh, countries, are actually ranked pretty low on the list. And it's countries like uh, Colombia, Finland, Israel. These countries tend to rank towards the top of that list, even though they have a fraction of the resources that we do here in America. I mean, you think about America in 2021, in the history of humanity, there have been few people that have more stuff than we do, and, and few people tend to be uh, less happy than we are. I'll, I'll tell you where we do rank in kind of the global rankings of things. We are, America is towards the top of, of uh, obesity, of personal debt, we're number one in the world for uh, being the most medicated. We're number one in the world for also having the most amount of uh, storage units. <laughs> Which just shows you, a as a country, as a culture, we have this excess of stuff and we're not happy. Which shows that maybe we need to reevaluate our answer to that question. Maybe more is the cause of our unhappiness. So how do you get it? How do you get happy then? Where do you find it from? If it's not in more, then where do you get it? Well, that's where Psalm 128, I think, is really helpful because this thing shows us uh, two realities that I want to look at with you this morning. It shows us the key to happiness and the secret to the key. The key to happiness, it's right here. Here's the key. And the secret to the key. So let's look at it one at a time. What is, what is the key to happiness? Well, it's right there in verse 1. It says, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Feels pretty straightforward, right? Blessed, happy, happy are those who fear the Lord. Now, what does that mean, though? Because fear of the Lord, does that mean 
God wants you to be afraid of him, like you're afraid of heights or you're afraid of spiders or something? Is that, is that what he wants, terror? Uh, no, probably the best translation of what this means would probably be the word reverence, to be in awe of him, uh, wonder and, and, and reverence. That's kind of what's at the heart of fear of the Lord. Think about it like the way that you relate to fire. You relate to fire. You have a healthy respect for fire because you know this thing is dangerous. It's, it's threatening. This is why you don't set up bonfires in the middle of your living room. It's going to destroy things if we don't protect this and watch this. And for as dangerous and as threatening as fire is, it is also simultaneously life-giving. It provides warmth, provides light. Uh, the, the other week, our family was with some family friends, and we were uh, uh, roasting marshmallows by a little campfire, and I just found myself, you know, hypnotized by it. You can just, a fire is so captive, and you can just stare at it for, <laughs> for hours, it feels like. It's, 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 it's threatening, it's serious, it's dangerous, and yet it's also mesmerizing, hypnotizing. Maybe, maybe a better way to think of it is like this. I don't know if you played sports growing up or you play sports right now. Uh, I played basketball growing up, had a high school basketball coach named Coach McKee, Mark McKee. Loved him. And in many ways, he was like a second father to me. He, uh, I would have done anything he asked me to do. I would have, you know, done push-ups, run laps, you know, whatever he asked. I would have taken a bullet for this dude. Such, you know, reverence and respect for him. And yet, at the same time, it's not like me and Coach McKee were like buddies. We, we weren't boys. We didn't like bro out on the weekend together. He was, he was always superior to me. And that's kind of what this fear of the Lord reality is getting at. It's this understanding that, th- that God is God and, and I am not. He, he, is, he is dangerous and threatening and yet captivating and beautiful. In fact, one of the, one of the authors that I read this week um, said that the fear of the Lord, what's getting at fear of the Lord is another way to understand it, is knowing your place in the world. Knowing your place in the universe, which means if you're going to know your place in the universe, you have to know God's place in the universe. He is God, I am not. He is the creator, I'm the created. He is sovereign, I am dependent. He is holy, I am sinful. Now, from my personal experience from being a person, uh, if you're anything like me, I don't like to think of myself as small and inadequate and dependent and flawed. I like to think I'm in control of my life, and yet part of what it means to fear the Lord is to know that God is the one in control, not us. In fact, that's actually the access to happiness, is for you to become smaller. Um, G.K. Chesterton wrote this fascinating little short story that I'm going to read to you. So it's just, it's very short, story time with Matt for just a few minutes. Uh, but I found this in a book, this is, this is retold by another guy named Mark Buchanan, so I'm reading his version of it, but, but he, here's what he says, this is really fascinating. He says, there was a young boy that was given a choice. He could become gigantic or he could become minuscule, and he chose to be gigantic. His head brushed the clouds. He waded the Atlantic like a pond, scooped gray whales into his hand and swished them like tadpoles in the bowl of his palm. He strode in a few bounds from one edge of the continent to the other. He kicked over a range of mountains like an anthill just because he could and he didn't feel like stepping over it. He plucked a California redwood and whittled its tip for a toothpick. And when he got tired, he stretched out across Nebraska and Ohio, flopped one arm into the Dakotas and the other into Canada, and slept in the grass. It was magnificent. It was spellbinding. It was exhilarating for about a day. And then it was boring. And the gigantic boy in his boredom daydreamed about having made the other choice to be minuscule. His backyard would have become an Amazonian rainforest. His gerbil would hulk larger than a woolly mammoth. And he could ride the back of a butterfly or go spelunking down wormholes. A tub of ice cream would be a winter playground of magic proportions. Life would have been so much more interesting had he chosen smallness. 
story time over. That's part of what it means to be, to know your place in the world. It's to get in touch with smallness. In fact, I don't know if you paid attention, but maybe, I don't know, a few minutes ago, the last song that we sang, did you know what you just sang? Did you know what you just prayed? You just prayed, make me poor and keep me low, seeking only thee to know. Did you know you just prayed, make me poor and keep me low? That's what we are after, is going after smallness, knowing our place in the world. God is God, I am not. He is big, I am small. As much as we are allergic to that, if you can get in touch with that fear of the Lord, that actually opens you up to happiness. So you might hear this and think, okay, sweet. Fear the Lord, walk in his ways. He's big, I'm small. Check, work on that this week. Now, if you go and you go work on that, uh, you're going to grow tired, discouraged, frustrated, and ultimately not happy. So if that's the key to happiness, what, what, what's the trick? How do, how do you get it? Because here's the thing. If you aim at happiness as the goal, what's the paradox of that is you don't get happiness. You don't get God either. You have to aim at something else. So let's look at that. This is the second thing. What, what is the secret to this whole key of happiness? To get at that, we need to look at the rest of the psalm. In verses 2 through 4, uh, the psalmist paints this picture of what he envisions as this happy life. This is just the blessed, the most blessed life he can picture in his mind. Look at verse 2. He says, you will eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed and it shall be well with you. Now, of course, this was an agricultural society, farming, gardening, animal husbandry. And he's saying that the blessed life, the good life, is when your fields are in full production and you're just eating the fruit of your own labors. You're just, you're just eating out of your own garden. Work is booming. Work is successful. And then he shifts from thinking about work to family. And look at what he says in verse 3. He says, your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. He compares his wife to a vine which is to say that she's fruitful, she's, she's, she's life-giving, lots of, lots of babies. And he says, your children will be like olive shoots, which is this picture of just they're full of promise, full of energy, they stick around forever. In his mind, this is his picture of the good life. This is, remember, this is an you know, ancient Hebrew context, and in this world, food and fertility were not guarantees. They're not guarantees in our world either, but we kind of live like they are. But in his world in particular, the, to have work and family thriving, that's the good life. Now, you can read this, and we've got to be careful here, because you might read this and say, okay, wait. If I fear the Lord and I walk in his ways, does that mean God's going to give me a successful job and a spouse and lots of kids? Is that what the psalm is promising? No. And here's why. You have to put this psalm within the context of the rest of the Bible. The rest of the Bible shows you lots of examples of people that feared the Lord and walked in his ways and didn't have a successful job and didn't have a family with lots of kids, Jesus being one of them. So what does this mean then? Well, I think what Psalm 128 is doing is there's something so fascinating going on in this psalm. This psalm, there's echoes of a story that came before that are reverberating throughout this thing. And you have to go back to catch it. If you go back to the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis, in the beginning of Genesis, God creates Adam and Eve and he throws them in the Garden of Eden and he says, hey, I am, I'm giving you everything that you can eat. It's just an all-you-can-eat buffet. Kiwis, kumquats, squash, uh, Brussels sprouts, whatever. Knock yourselves out. Go hard in the paint with everything that you see. It's all for you. Except, I should say, one little tree over here. I don't want you to eat that. If you eat that, you're going to die. Everything else, though, it's for you. And you remember, there's the serpent that comes in and twists God's words and looks at them and says, okay, wait, God is holding out on you. Here's the thing that God said you can't have. If you want to be happy, he, he must not want you to be happy. If you want to be happy, you need more than what God's providing. If you want to be happy, you have to cut ties with this joker and go find happiness for yourself. And, of course, they do. And they go and eat from that tree, and instead of experiencing blessing, they begin to experience curse. And the curse that they experience is found in two 
fundamental areas of their lives, work and family. God looks at Adam and says, I know work was designed to be this life-giving, joyful, amazing thing, but now it's going to be really difficult, frustrating. Here's what he says. He says, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. Not just work, but family is cursed. Family is designed to be this life-giving institution, and God looks at Eve and says to her, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. So put all that together. Here's what this means. Adam and Eve seek happiness apart from God. And instead of experiencing blessing, they experience curse in their work and in their family. And here comes Psalm 128, and it says, this curse has been reversed. That there is now blessing coming to work and to family. And you're like, okay, how can just Psalm, how could this Psalm just announce that? How can it just say, well, the curse is over? Here's how. Here's the secret. The secret to understanding the psalm is knowing that before the psalm is about you and me, it's about someone else first. In the midst of all of those curses in Genesis 3, God also gives this promise. And he says, to, he says to Eve, one day, centuries from now, one of your great, 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 great grandsons is going to come forth. And he's going to crush the serpent and all of his lies. And he's going to win victory. It's going to come at his own expense. He's going he's to be wounded in the process but it will come. And centuries later, sure enough, one of Eve's great descendants, Jesus himself, shows up. And in himself, he embodies what it means to fear the Lord. He makes himself small. Think about this. He is the sovereign creator of all that is. He made all the galaxies. He holds them all in the palm of his hand by the word of his power. And he made himself a single cell. It's hard to make yourself much smaller than that. He makes himself dependent on his mother's milk, dependent on oxygen, dependent on his father. He fears the Lord and perfectly walks in his ways, and yet, instead of receiving blessing, what does he, what does he receive at the end of his life? Curse. In fact, in the Old Testament, there's this fascinating verse where it says, anybody who is hung on a tree is cursed of God. People in the Old Testament, if somebody was executed, it was usually by stoning, and then they would hang up the body. I know this is grotesque, but they would hang up the body on a tree as a way to symbolize divine rejection. And Paul, in the New Testament, he, he, he understands this verse. He sees what happens to Jesus on the cross, being hung up on a wooden cross, a tree, and he makes this connection. Why is Jesus on the cross? Why is the blessed one on a cross? And here's what he says in Galatians chapter 3. He says, he redeemed us from the curse by becoming a curse for us so that the blessing might come to us. You see what's going on? Jesus is trading places with us. He is receiving the curse that you and I deserve so that we might receive the blessing that he deserves. And not just us individually, he throws his blessing over every square inch of the planet. In fact, every year at Christmas, we sing this song, Joy to the World. You may, you may know where I'm going with this, but there's this amazing verse in that song where it says, no more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. Thorns, that's Genesis 3 language, curse language. And then it says, he came to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. Far as far as the curse is found, he makes his blessing flow. He's undoing the curse. He's reversing the curse. Why? Because he became a curse for us. Here's the point. The key to happiness is the fear of the Lord. But here's the thing. You can't generate that in and of yourself. You can't just look at your soul and say, fear the Lord. Your soul doesn't respond like that. You have to behold something outside of you that you find beautiful. When you look at Jesus... And you see his willingness to undergo the curse for you so that you might receive the blessing. You begin to think to yourself, who has ever loved me like that? Who has sacrificed to that degree? When you see that, that's what begins to move your heart. That's what begins to melt your heart. And you begin to experience wonder, delight, 
joy, awe, fear of the Lord, love in response to love. When that starts to click inside of you, your heart starts to become convinced, maybe slowly, maybe all at once, that happiness is not found in more. Happiness is found in him. And if I have him, I can lose it all. And it'll be painful, and it'll be awful, but if I have him, I don't need anything else. This is why for centuries the Christian church has sang this song, Be Thou My Vision. Let me read you one verse from the song, and then I'm done. The verse goes like this. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only, first in my heart, high king of heaven, my treasure thou art. What would compel anyone to say, I don't want riches. I don't care about man's praise. I don't care about wealth and I don't care about reputation. It's only when someone's heart has been captivated enough to say, high king of heaven, my treasure thou art. To see this high lifted up, sovereign, big, above me, God, who's not just above me, he's also my treasure, precious to me. Look to Jesus and have your heart be melted by what he has done. And keep looking at Jesus until your heart gets melted. Blessed is everyone who walks in his ways and who fears the Lord. Consider that an invitation for you this morning. Let me pray. Father, I pray that you would give us eyes to see Jesus and the beauty of it, the wonder of who he is and what he has done for us. And I pray that that would not just be interesting theological data, some fascinating historical spiritual idea that you find in church, but I pray that that reality would traumatize us in the, most, in the best of ways, that it would undo us, that it would, it would shake up the foundations that may have grown cold in our hearts, that we would see the wonder of a God who out of complete grace would give himself for someone like us, who would make this trade, this incredibly uneven trade of giving up your most precious son in order to get train wrecks like us in return. I pray that that would move us in the core of our being so that we might begin to experience and taste fear of the Lord. Make us poor and keep us low, seeking only thee to know. That is our prayer, and we would ask this in Jesus' name.